Today we're going to talk about diabetes and the complications that can arise with hyperglycemic episodes. We'll talk about diabetic ketoacidosis and hyperglycemic hyperosmolar syndrome. To review what you learned in block two, diabetes is characterized by hyperglycemia, which is caused by a defect in insulin production, insulin secretion or action, or both. We have type 1 diabetes, which is typically your childhood onset. Type 2 diabetes is a progressive resistance to insulin or um, prolonged bad diet, lack of exercise. Gestational diabetes develops during pregnancy. When we talk about type 1 diabetes, this is related to the beta cells in the pancreas, which are destroyed by either a genetic component, an immuno immunologic component, or other environmental factors. So you basically have the pancreas that is not able to produce as much insulin as the body needs or any insulin at all. Um, we have the decreased in insulin production um, the glucose production from the liver maintains the um, remains normal. So there's no, you know, your pancreas is what is not working. Your liver is still able to produce glucose. So when we have that mismatch, your hyperglycemic episodes are the result. So these patients are dependent on IV or IM insulin. When we talk about type 2 diabetes, this is that increased or progressive resistance to insulin. In younger patients, you know, there's typically not a development of diabetes. It's a progressive resistance to insulin, or they eventually have an impaired insulin secretion. Most adults will have the onset of diabetes or it will be an onset in adult years. It's not typically the type of diabetes that's found in children or adolescents. It is that slow and progressive intolerance to glucose. The way that we diagnose diabetes, either type 1 or type 2, is we look at their fasting blood glucose. If it is 126 or more, then we would think that they are likely developing a diabetic condition. Casual blood glucose exceeding 200. So the difference between your fasting and your casual fasting is they've had several hours, at least eight hours of not eating or drinking and then your casual blood glucose would be at any point during the day. So if we just are spot checking blood glucose levels and we have a patient with a blood glucose over 200, then we can assume they likely have some sort of a diabetic condition developing. Classic symptoms that a patient would complain of if they are starting to develop diabetes or they have had uh, diabetes and it's just been undiagnosed is your polyuria, which is excessive urine production or excessive urination, polydipsia, and uh, polyphagia as well. So polydipsia is um, excessive thirst, and polyphagia is excessive eating. Um, they might also complain of an unexpected or unexplained weight loss. Our main goal for diabetic patients is to normalize their insulin activity and regulate blood glucose levels. We want to reduce the development of complications that are related to diabetes in the first place. So your diabetic neuropathy, your kidney function that can result from um, uncontrolled diabetes. Uh, high blood pressure can also affect um, diabetes uh, manifestations. So as long as we can control the patient's insulin and keep their blood sugar levels within normal limits, then we can hopefully prevent 
any complications of diabetes from developing or minimize the severity of the complications should they develop. When we talk about the American Diabetes Association, they recommend that a person maintain the hemoglobin A1C under 7%. So the hemoglobin A1C is a blood test that can be done that looks at the past like three to six months of insulin or blood sugar levels in a patient. And if we can keep that number under 7%, then we know the patient, if they are a diabetic, they are under good glycemic control. If we have a patient who does not have a history of diabetes, but maybe they've had some of the symptoms develop the polyphagia, polyuria, polydipsia, they've had unexplained weight loss, and they're just complaining of some, some symptoms that we can relate to diabetes, then we could uh, draw this hemoglobin A1C and see what it comes back as. If they come back over that 7%, then we would need to do a little bit more digging and likely the patient would end up with a diabetes diagnosis. When we talk about the hemoglobin A1C, this is specifically the amount of glucose that is attached to the hemoglobin. It gives, again, that average of blood, glu blood glucose levels over the last several months. Normal person, non-diabetic, healthy, good diet, we would expect their hemoglobin A1C to be under 5.7%. We would consider them a pre-diabetic if their um, hemoglobin A1C comes back at that 5.7 to 6.5% um, range. If they are a-diabetic or they are going to be diagnosed with diabetes, then we would expect that level to be greater than the 6.5%. So when the American Diabetic Association recommends that it be under 7%, this is referring to patients with diabetes. We would hope that a diabetic patient can keep it underneath that 7% because that means they are taking their medications as prescribed or their insulin as prescribed and the medications are working as they should and that patient has a good glycemic control. When we talk about medical management or nursing management, this would be nutritional therapy for the patient. So giving them that diabetic diet, foods they can eat, foods they can't eat, um, what they need to really avoid, um, how much sugar can they eat, you know, what are different foods that they can eat that they still enjoy but aren't going to send their blood glucose levels skyrocketing. Exercise is always beneficial, whether you're a diabetic or not, but with patients who have diabetes, they need to be careful and exercise in moderation because excessive exercise can result in hypoglycemic episodes. Diabetic patients need to understand that consistent monitoring of their blood glucose levels is imperative to the overall management of the disease and its progression. If they are not checking their blood sugars regularly, they are not checking them you know, before they eat, after they eat, not eating the correct foods, their blood sugars are going to be out of, out of control and they will likely um, develop complications that can become severe. Pharmacological therapy, that would be either your oral uh, hyperglycemic or antihyperglycemic medications. If they need insulin therapy, it would be following their insulin regimen the way they're supposed to. But educating the patient in the importance of following their medication regimen as prescribed. And then education as far as, you know, foot care, because as we know, complications related to diabetes can be that diabetic neuropathy. They could have wounds on their feet and not feel them because of the decreased sensation. So daily foot care, um, dietary management, medication regimen, all of these educational pieces we need to include when we're talking with our patients. Here's uh, pictures that 
represent the types of diabetes that we most commonly see. Diabetes type 1, um, again, you have the polyuria, polydipsia, and polyphagia, which is the increased urination, increased thirst, and increased hunger. These patients could have that unexplained weight loss. They might be fatigued. Um, they just don't have the energy. They could also have an increased frequency of infection, so they might just be sick a lot. Um, an infection can increase their risk of developing or going into a diabetic ketoacidosis state. Um, it's a rapid onset typically in childhood. Um, they'll typically diagnose this when a child comes into the hospital being sick. And if it's not caught soon, then uh, it could be a very poor outcome. Again, these patients are insulin dependent because the pancreas itself is either not producing enough insulin or is not producing insulin at all. So these patients rely on insulin therapy in order to maintain appropriate blood glucose levels. Um, you might even see, uh, fairly common, you'll see these patients having uh, insulin pumps. If you have uh, parents that are type 1 diabetics, then their children uh, are more prone to also being a type 1 diabetic. Uh, 10 to 15 years is about the, the time frame that you would see this in patients. For type 2 diabetes, this is the adult onset again. Um, sedentary lifestyle, lack of exercise, poor diet. Um, average age of uh, diagnosis is about 50 years. They likely also have a history of hypertension or higher blood pressures. They, these patients are also fatigued. They just don't have energy, which then exacerbates their sedentary lifestyle. They are often obese. They will have recurrent infections just because they don't have the um, appropriate circulation to really clear these infections. You'll also see polyuria and polydipsia with type 2. To diagnose type 2, you would see those fasting blood sugars that are higher than the 126. So how can we manage diabetes? Again, normalize the insulin activity, stabilize blood glucose levels. Our goal in care is to reduce the associated complications. Patient education is key. Nutritional consultations, making sure these patients are aware of their caloric intake and they're controlling what they're eating. Exercise is important to maintain an acceptable body weight, but excessive exercise again can result in hypoglycemic events. Pharmacolo pharmacological management, whether that be insulin therapy or oral um, anti-hypoglycemic medications, and then patient support for the lifestyle and dietary change. If we simply were to give these patients education upon discharge and then not have the appropriate follow-up resources, then the patient will struggle to manage their disease. So we really need to make sure these patients go home with appropriate support so that they can be successful in managing their disease. Biggest concern is portion control when we talk about diet, maintaining that reasonable caloric intake. They need to have protein on their plate, um, smaller amounts of the starchy vegetables, and they can have about half of the plate that has non-starchy vegetables. But we have to remember with starch is it converts to sugar. So if they are eating a whole lot of starchy vegetables, then their blood sugars won't be as well controlled. So healthy fruits, um, whole grains, legumes, low fat dairy is appropriate. Um, fiber rich fruits, lean protein, eggs, fish, seafood, and uh, lean chicken or turkey. Glycemic index is an important factor in managing the progression of diabetes. When we talk about glycemic index, that is combining starchy foods with protein 
to slow the absorption and the glycemic response to the starch so that they can still have those foods, but they're eating them in moderation and they've got the protein to go with it. Raw foods or whole foods have a lower glycemic response. That's why the, um, those are better for patients. Whole fruit is better than fruit juice for two reasons. One, you've got a fiber content when you're actually eating the fruit uh, versus the fruit juice. And more often than not, your fruit juices have added sugar. So these are not good for diabetic patients to drink. Alcohol is super high in carbs and it has a very fast absorption rate. So your patients need to understand, you know, it's not that they can't have alcohol at all, but they need to make sure that they're aware of their blood sugars and they're not just drinking in excess because their blood sugars will be out of control if they drink in excess. When we talk about exercise, exercise lowers your blood glucose levels. It's good for that, it's good for weight loss, um, obviously lowers our risks of heart disease, which we know heart disease combined with diabetes increases our risk for heart attacks and strokes significantly. But excessive exercise, again, um, risk for hypoglycemic events. So if a patient is working out excessively and they either didn't eat enough or um, aren't eating like a snack right before, they risk becoming hypoglycemic during the exercise and could become unconscious during the exercise if it's bad enough. So if our patients are going to exercise, we want to make sure they eat um, at least a 15 gram carb snack right before they begin the exercise. That way they're still going to get the benefits of exercise, but they're not going to drop their blood sugars too low. Um, these are basic survival information for patient education. We want to make sure they know they know their disease. They know what's going to happen, you know, if they eat this or if they exercise or, you know, what they can substitute. Um, it's imperative that they know normal blood glucose level ranges. Um, what would indicate they were at risk for being hypoglycemic? What would indicate they were at risk for being hyperglycemic? They need to know and understand these ranges. So we talk about insulin, what does insulin do? Well, we know that it transports the glucose to be metabolized as energy. So liver produces glucose, pancreas uh, produces the insulin. They work together to maintain and uh, provide energy to the body. Um, insulin stimulates the glucose storage in the liver so that the muscle can use it and then it also signals the liver to stop releasing the glucose. It accelerates the transport of the amino acids into the cells. We have the breakdown of the stored glucose or it inhibits, excuse me, the breakdown of stored glucose, protein, and fat. So we don't, you know, we want to use glucose for energy. We don't want to use our protein, our stored protein and fat as energy because that's where the weight loss would come into play. So we have to have insulin. Different types of insulin. We have our rapid insulin, short acting and long acting. Our um, rapid insulin will start to work in five to 10 minutes and it peaks after 30 to 90 minutes. Your short acting would be um, starts or starts to work in about 30 minutes to an hour and peaks in about two to five hours. Our long acting insulin, these are your Lantus or your Levomir, those will be the insulins that are given to patients at night that provide that steady control of their blood sugar levels throughout the night so that they don't wake up in the morning hypoglycemic. Depending on what type of insulin they're on or what their regimen is, they could have one to four injections per day, depending on their needs. And then you'll likely see the combination of a rapid or a short acting insulin combined with that long acting insulin to better regulate their blood sugar levels throughout the day and throughout the night. 
We can give insulin uh, through just your traditional injections, so your sub-Q uh, injections, the needles that you'll drop out of the vials in the hospitals. A lot of hospitals now are using insulin pens, so a patient would uh, have their own pen for the duration of their stay in the hospital, and you would just click the pen to the appropriate dose and then give that. Um, there's jet injectors and there's also insulin pumps. If your patient comes into the hospital and they have an insulin pump, it's important that you actually um, turn off that insulin pump because if they're not eating, if they're NPO and they're still on that insulin pump, it's still going to give them insulin and you run a significant risk of causing that patient to become hypoglycemic. The patients need to understand um, for discharge home and home management of their diabetes, they again, they need to know the differences between hypo and hyperglycemia how they can effectively monitor their glucose. If it's their first time doing insulin injections, we need to spend some time teaching them how to self-inject their insulin. Or if they're going to start on an insulin pump, they need to understand how to work the pump, how to change the insulin cartridge, how to change the needle going into their skin. And then if they have the monitoring device that also attaches to their arm, they need to know how to change those and change the site as needed. There are uh, lots of different kinds of insulin. Some can be mixed, some cannot. So it's important that we review that with the patient. Um, your long acting insulins and uh, like your Novolog 7030s, those cannot be mixed. So it's important that we understand what can and can't be mixed as far as insulin is concerned. Just a quick refresher on drawing up insulin and what you can combine. Um, you always want to draw up your clear insulin first and then draw up the cloudy insulin. And make sure you're using the appropriate size syringe. If you're only drawing up, you know, 5 to 10, maybe 15 units of insulin, you can use the 30 unit syringe. If you're pulling up between 25 to 40, units, then you would use the 50 uh, unit syringe. And then if you're pulling up the dose that's greater than 40 units, you would want to use um, the 100 unit syringe. So it's very important that you're using the appropriate size syringe so that you can pull up the appropriate dose and not make a medication error. Most hospitals do require any insulin injection or insulin drip to be a two nurse verification because there have been enough medication errors with insulin causing a detrimental outcome to the patient that this is a high-risk medication and requires a two-nurse verification. Education on insulin self-management. They need to understand the use and the action of insulin. Why are they on insulin and what is the insulin going to do to their body? It's imperative that they understand both the signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia and what they need to do to manage each of those conditions should they develop. Blood glucose monitoring is important, documenting and keeping track, you know, keeping a journal, so to speak, of their blood sugar so that they can provide that uh, several day or several week to month um, picture of what their insulin or their blood sugar levels are doing and then making sure they understand how to self-inject their insulin, if they're using syringes and a vial, or if they're using an insulin pen, or if they are being fitted with an insulin pump. They need to know how to use it, how to change the site, and um, those the monitoring devices that go along with the insulin pumps. Considering our goal of diabetic management is to minimize any complications that can develop, let's talk about some of those complications. If we have poorly controlled diabetes, then we could see um, accelerated atherosclerotic changes, coronary artery disease, cerebrovascular disease, and uh, peripheral vascular disease. Diabetic retinopathy, which is the damage to the small blood vessels that nourish the retina, so you can have changes in vision. Ne uh, nephropathy is a kidney disease secondary to diabetes. You'll see this 
um, maybe 10 to 15 years into the disease. So it wouldn't be a, a right away, you know, they get diabetes or type 2 diabetes, and then you're also going to get diagnosed with uh, kidney, kidney disease. This would be 10 or so years after their initial diagnosis, um, likely poor, uh, poorly managed diabetes. So you'll see those kidney diseases develop as a result of that. I would say maybe 20 to 30 percent of type 1 and type 2 diabetics will develop uh, nephropathy, but your type 2 diabetics are more, um, more likely to progress into that end stage um, kidney failure. Very, very important that we are monitoring kidney function with diabetic patients so that we can hopefully prevent them from developing that end-stage disease. Peripheral neuropathy is a decreased sensation that can result or progress into a complete loss of feeling in their legs or um, feet and even their hands. Um, starts as kind of that prickling feeling, maybe a tingling, uh, numbing sensation, or maybe even burning and these sensations can be worse at night. You might have your patient complaining, you know, of the symptoms being increased at night and affecting their ability to sleep. Autonomic neuropathies, these are some cardiac symptoms that can range from a sustained, uh, slightly tachycardic heart rate. They could have a silent MI, so uh, like we uh, talked about in block two with cardiac, your silent MIs can come, uh, they have that ST elevation, and they'll see um, an elevated uh, cardiac enzyme or elevated troponin level, but they have no chest pain, and that's because there's the neuropathy present that uh, affects or changes the pain pathways. Um, orthostatic hypotension can also be an autonomic response. Um, the body doesn't sense their position changes. Uh, and as we know, when you know you go from laying down to sitting up or sitting to standing, our body is supposed to compensate and uh, raise the heart rate, raise the blood pressure, so that we don't have the uh, syncopal episode. But with the autonomic neuropathy, our body might not sense those changes as fast, and you would see that orthostatic hypotension. Uh, we could also have some urinary retention due to the decreased sensation in the bladder this uh, could ultimately result in a neurogenic bladder. Hypoglycemic unawareness. What do I mean when I talk about that? This is where diabetes has become so severe or so uncontrolled that there has been damage to the adrenal medulla. And this results in a diminished or absent adrenergic, symptom, uh, adrenergic symptoms of hypoglycemia. So, you know, when a patient becomes hypoglycemic, they would feel shaky or anxious. You might see some sweating, they might be nervous, or just other hypoglycemic symptoms. When we have the damage to the adrenal medulla, there's a diminished or absent adrenergic symptom. So they're not they're going to be hypoglycemic, but their body's not going to sweat. They're not going to have the feelings of shakiness or nervousness. They might not be tachycardic um, or any, any of those symptoms. So that would be hypoglycemic unawareness. So hypoglycemia, this is an abnormally low blood glucose level. It could be uh, it's typically less than 50, but if we have a patient whose blood glucose is less than 70, we're going to start treating them to avoid their blood sugar going even lower. We can have this as a result of too much insulin or uh, oral hypoglycemics in proportion to the glucose that is in the blood. So maybe they overdosed themselves on insulin or they took too much of their medication and there's not enough sugar in their blood. So that results in the, you know, the insulin or the oral hypoglycemics pulling all that glucose into the cells for use of energy. 
and not having enough glucose left in the blood to maintain normal levels. Also, excessive physical activity or not eating enough can cause hypoglycemic episodes. The adrenergic symptoms, that is the sweating, tremors, tachycardia, palpitations, nervousness, hunger, pallor, or shakiness can be uh, physical symptoms that the patient will display if they are becoming hypoglycemic. Central nervous uh, symptoms, these would be your inability to concentrate. They might be altered. They could have some slurred speech, maybe drowsy or fatigued. Um, short-term memory lapse, like they just, they can't remember what they were doing, or just some general confusion. Headache is also a pretty common sign um, when a patient is experiencing hypoglycemic event. When we have severe hypoglycemia, this is when, you know, we, we had that blood sugar that was maybe 65 or 70, or maybe even 75, and we didn't treat it, or we didn't treat it fast enough, and it became even more severe because the body is just going to keep using the, the glucose that's left and we're not replacing it. This could uh, range from just disorientation to your patient could have a seizure and loss of consciousness. And severe, severe cases can result in death because if you don't have enough blood sugar, your body cannot, or if you don't have enough glucose in your blood, your body cannot function. Covering the hypoglycemic unawareness, this would be no warning signs until their blood glucose is critically low. So they could be, you know, totally fine. They're not sweating. They're not tachycardic. They don't have a headache. And then all of a sudden they go unconscious because their blood sugar is 25 or 30. Um, again, that's the, the autonomic neuropathy and the lack of the, the hormones that cause those symptoms to show up. Patients who are at risk for hypoglycemia unawareness should keep their blood glucose levels a little bit higher. So, you know, we, we want blood glucose levels to be in that 80 to 100 range. So maybe your patients who are at risk for this should keep their blood glucose levels around like 120. Um, but keeping them higher so that they have a little bit more of a buffer should they drop too low. If your patient is alert and they are able to swallow, if they are hypoglycemic, give them 15 grams of a fast-acting uh, concentrated carbohydrate. So this would be your glucose tabs or the tubes of the glucose gel. Um, or four to six ounces of juice or regular soda, so something that has a large amount of sugar in it. This, again, is only if they are alert and uh, can swallow without risk of aspiration. You want to retest their blood glucose level in about 15 minutes and retreat them if needed. So if in 15 minutes, you know, they only came up maybe five to ten points, I would treat them again, or if they dropped even lower, they need to be treated again, but then I would consider, do we need to start an IV and give them um, IV dextrose, or do they need an IM injection of glucagon? After we have treated them with the glucose tabs or the gel, they need a snack that's got protein and carbs within 30 minutes of giving them the glucose tabs or else their blood sugar will just drop again. They need something that their body can digest to raise their levels of glucose. If the patient cannot swallow or they are unconscious, we would use uh, glucagon, which is an IM or sub-Q injection that we can give right in their arm, and that will raise their blood glucose level, hopefully to the point where they would regain consciousness and then maybe they could drink some juice or um, in, take the glucose gel or eat the glucose tablets. Um, if they are not responding to the glucagon and you can start an IV, then we would give them 25 to 50 mLs of the 50% dextrose solution. So this is the big syringe of IV dextrose. 
and you could start with half of the syringe just giving them the 25 and hopefully raise their blood sugar enough to where they'll regain consciousness but you may have to give them the full 50 mls of the dextrose once they have regained consciousness they still need to eat something something with protein and carbs to maintain their glucose levels because their body will just burn off the sugar you just gave them and they could become hypoglycemic and uh, lose consciousness again. We need to determine the causes. Why did they become hypoglycemic in the first place and correct that? Diabetic ketoacidosis is one of the most common complications that can occur. You'll see it more with your type 1 diabetics. This is caused by a profound deficiency of insulin. So they, you know, because it's more common with your type 1 diabetics, you know, maybe their insulin pump stopped working or the battery died or um, they forgot to change the cartridge um, or they just were not managing it appropriately from the beginning they will have hyperglycemia symptoms. They'll be um, ketosis, acidosis, have dehydration. They will be very fluid deficit. Without the insulin in the system, the amount of glucose that's going into the cells is reduced. So it just is kind of hanging out in the bloodstream the production of glucose by the liver is actually increased and this causes that hyperglycemic state. Um, in an attempt to get rid of all this extra glucose that's just floating around, the kidneys will excrete glucose along with the water and electrolytes. Um, so that's where you get that dehydration and you'll see the glucose in the urine known as the uh, osmotic diuresis. That's excessive urination. That's where your polyuria comes in. Um, leads to dehydration. They've got marked electrolyte loss as well. Um, patients in DKA can lose up to six and a half liters of water. Um, they'll lose sodium, they'll lose potassium, and even chloride over, the, over a 24 hour period and just results in that acidotic state, the, the ketosis and whatnot. It's just not a good combination at all. The ketosis comes into play because you've got the, um, with the insulin deficiency, there's also a deficit in the breakdown of fat um, into the free fatty acids or glycerol. This, the fatty acids get converted into um, ketone bodies by the liver. Ketones are acid. Um, their accumulation in the bloodstream because they're not getting broken down leads to that metabolic acidosis. So just this whole kind of combination and storm that ensues because of this deficiency of insulin. Precipitating factors to DKA are illness, infection, inadequate insulin dosage, so either their pump wasn't set right, they weren't dosing themselves correctly, um, they could have undiagnosed type 1 diabetes, this would be, uh, finding a patient in DKA would be a common way that type 1, di uh, type 1 diabetes is diagnosed in the first place. Um, poor self-management, if you have a type 1 diabetic who just doesn't care anymore, which happens uh, pretty common, they will end up in the hospital in DKA because they are choosing to not manage their uh, diabetes effectively. And then neglect. If you have a type 1 diabetic who is reliant on family or caregivers, if they're not getting what they need, then they can end up in DKA. So the pathophysiology of DKA, you've got that, um, you know, the beta cell destruction or lack of production or what have you. That leads to our insulin deficiency. This leads to the decreased uh, tissue glucose utilization. So we don't have the cells using the glucose for energy. So it stays in the blood. It's spilling over into 
the blood. Um, that is where we see the hyperglycemia result and the kidneys try and get rid of the excess glucose. You see polyuria and polydipsia, the excessive urination, excessive thirst because they have the excessive urination. So there's our volume depletion. They are just urinating a ton. So any fluid that they are taking in is just kind of going right back out. We end up in the diabetic ketoacidosis state. So clinical manifestations of DKA, you've got the dehydration, signs of that, uh, poor skin turgor, dry mucous membranes. I, I can't emphasize enough the uh, excessive thirst. They could be drinking a ton and just still thirsty, dry mouth, not, you know, just not feeling like they're hydrated. Um, tachycardia as a result of the volume depletion and then orthostatic hypotension also because they're volume depleted. Lethargy and weakness are earlier signs of it. Um, skin is dry, could be loose because the volume deficit. Uh, abdominal pain is common. Um, anorexia, nausea, vomiting are common. Um, Kussmaul respirations. So this is that uh, breathing pattern. They're trying to regulate their um, the metabolic acidosis. They're trying to fix it. So they go into this breathing pattern, and they've got a sweet, fruity breath. Um, odor to their breath. With metabolic acidosis, that results because you've got the, the low serum bicarb. So their bicarb is still is going to be uh, typically less than the 16. They'll also have a low pH, so it should be somewhere around 7.3 or lower. Um, They've got a respiratory compensation trying to fix that. So the two small respirations, it's that rapid, deep, later, labored breathing. Um, ketones are actually released through the exhalation. So that's where you get that fruity breath, um, the fruity odor to their breath. You'll see the presence of the ketones in the blood and the urine, just because the excessive glucose, it's spilling over. Your electrolytes will vary depending on the severity of dehydration. You could see hyperkalemia or hypokalemia. Um, you'll either need to replace potassium, depending, uh, or once you start insulin therapy on these patients, the hyperkalemia will correct itself because the insulin will drive the potassium back into the cells, which will in turn lower your serum potassium levels. Fluid replacement is key for these patients. They're going to get a ton of fluids to help dilute the glucose levels in the blood and restore fluid status as well as um, electrolyte status. Your patients who are less severe, you could probably treat them on an outpatient basis and send them home. But if they have severe uh, manifestations of DKA, they will require an ICU admission, insulin drip, and very close monitoring. We want to make sure when we're treating patients with DKA that they have a patent airway and we give them oxygen as needed. Um, some of your more severe cases of DKA, they might be unconscious. So we have to make sure that they can protect their airway. And is there something that we need to do, uh, do how we need to intervene to make sure that they have a patent airway? Early, early IV access and begin fluid resuscitation. These patients are going to get a lot of um, a lot of fluids, like two, three liters of fluid from the get-go to help restore fluid status, dilute the uh, blood glucose levels, and um, restore electrolyte imbalance. We may need to replace potassium. We just have to monitor their uh, CMP levels, their potassium levels. Monitoring the blood glucose, watching their renal function, and closely monitoring urinary output. So we know that we're giving them excessive amounts of fluid 
we want to know how much is coming out. We'll do lung assessments, so listening to breath sounds fairly frequently to make sure that we're not throwing them into a fluid volume overload. And then uh, we want to reverse the acidosis. Um, again, the hyperkalemia would be present, and if it is, we're just going to watch it because the insulin and fluid replacement will correct the serum potassium levels, but we would want to be watchful for them becoming uh, hypokalemic. Uh, and again, a lot of these patients are going to require an ICU admission, but we might have caught the DKA soon enough that we could treat them on an outpatient basis and then they could go home. These patients are going to require insulin IV drips if they are to be hospitalized. These will be your, your ICU patients again. Um, regular insulin is what we use for um, IV. We convert the, the IV drip to like hourly infusion rates, so it'll depend on the protocol that your hospital uses as to where you'll start, you know, how many units per hour you'll start the patient on. It, it goes off of what their initial blood sugar was and how we want to bring them down. We have to be careful that we don't drop these patients too fast, you know, or too quickly because then we could throw them right into a hypoglycemic event. Um, so there would be whatever your drip is, whatever your hospital's protocol is, is how you'll hang this drip. And then they, the patient stays on the insulin drip continuously until they reach a point that they can be converted to subcutaneous administration of insulin. Anytime we interrupt this insulin drip, anytime you know we stop it or, or something happens that they aren't getting that infusion of insulin, that can result in the patient going back into that hyperglycemic episode or into the uh, DKA or worsening of DKA. So we need to, these patients are likely going to be on the insulin drip for 12 to 24 hours until their serum bicarbonate levels come back into a normal range or you know when the patient can sit up and eat um, sometimes we have to give patients a sodium bicarb uh, injection to help correct that imbalance The use of sodium bicarb, however, is it's rare. You don't have to do it. Most of the time, most of your DKA patients, even the most severe ones, we can correct the DKA state with just an insulin infusion. So these patients go to the ICU, they get um, fluid replacements. Initial Fluid replacement again is at like two to three liters, but over the course of this patient's treatment, like the first 12 to 24 hours, they could get upwards of six to 10 liters of fluid replacement. Um, the two to three liters is that initial, we need to get their blood sugar down, we need to restore uh, the fluid balance because they're, they're so uh, deficit with fluid. So that initial replacement will be the two to three liters, but again, over the course of the treatment could be upwards of six to 10 liters, just depending on their needs. But with that much fluid, again, lung assessment, serial breath sounds are key to making sure that we don't throw them into a fluid overload status. Now we'll move on to talk about hyperosmolar hyperglycemic syndrome, or HHS. This is a metabolic disorder of type 2 diabetes that results from a, a relative insulin deficiency, typically um, precipitated by an illness that raises the body's demand for insulin. So something happens that our body needs more insulin than what we're producing. So then we don't get the amount of insulin we need. And hypo uh, or hyperosmolarity and hyperglycemia result. Ketosis with these patients is typically uh, very minimal or even absent. So that's what differentiates 
HHS from DKA is you don't have that ketosis. This is a life-threatening syndrome. Um, your precipitating factors, again, infection or illness. So UTIs can do it, pneumonia, uh, some sort of septic infection, acute illness, um, newly diagnosed type 2 diabetes. So they you know, were recently diagnosed and maybe don't quite understand how to manage their diabetes or they're still learning how to manage it. They can end up in this syndrome. Um, they have an impaired thirst sensation or inability to replace fluids. The persistent hyperglycemia in HHS causes this osmotic diuresis. So you have that excessive wa uh, loss of water and electrolytes. And where we get that hyperosmolar um, part of it is you have to, for the body to maintain this osmotic equilibrium, the you know, balance in the body, water shifts from where we need it from the intracellular fluid to the extracellular fluid space so then we get um, glycosuria and dehydration we get hypernitremia and increased uh, osmolarity overall is what occurs we see this a lot in older adults who have no known history of diabetes or they have you know, that, that newly diagnosed type 2 diabetes is where we'll, we'll see this syndrome develop. Um, hypotension is common. Remember this, this fluid shift, the fluid is not where it needs to be. So we will see hypotension with you know, the profound dehydration, worse than what you'll see with DKA. They've got super dry mucous membranes, very poor skin turgor, tachycardia, um, variable neuro neurologic signs. So they could just be altered and slurred speech to that seizure activity or um, other neurologic signs that would be more severe than what you would see with the DKA patients. Again, we don't have enough circulating insulin um, to prevent the ketoacidosis. There's fewer symptoms in HHS than there are in DKA. This leads to much higher blood glucose levels. So these are the patients, you'll see a blood glucose level above 600, even into the thousands. They've got the more severe neurologic manifestations because of the increased serum osmolality. The ketones in the blood and urine are absent, or if they are present, they're very minimal, just because the, the ketones is not a factor of HHS. Um, when we have this, the pathophysiology, looking at the pathophysiology side, we've got extreme hyperglycemia. This causes that severe osmotic uh, diuresis and fluid volume deficit. Where the fluids go, the electrolytes follow. So you'll see a decrease in sodium, potassium, and phosphorus. So then you've got the electrolyte imbalance and uh, issues that can occur with that. Because we're fluid volume deficit, we've lost all this water. We have the profound dehydration uh, manifestations leads to hyperosmolarity. So we've got um, an elevated osmolality level in our blood. Um, hypovolemic, they, their blood pressures are going to be much lower. We know that when we are fluid deficit and hypovolemic um, hypotension, renal perfusion is going to decrease because they're not getting the, the kidneys aren't getting the blood perfusion that they need. Uh, will be hemoconcentrated, so the blood, uh, not enough fluid in it. They could become oliguric because of the decrease in renal perfusion. So we're not, we're, um, the kidneys are not functioning the way they should. Urine production is going to be decreased. They could eventually become aneuric. Um, with the hypotension, the tissues are not getting the blood flow or the oxygen that they need. This will elevate our lactic acid. Um, thrombus can develop because our blood is concentrated. All of this can lead to seizures, uh, shock states, coma, and eventually death. This is a, a very severe syndrome that can occur that requires rapid treatment in order to avoid um, the patient dying as a result.
the treatment of HHS is very similar to DKA because ultimately uh, both syndromes are that profound uh, hyperglycemia, uh, significantly elevated blood glucose levels, HHS more so than DKA. Um, you'll see blood glucose levels in the 3, 4, 5, and, and 600 ranges with DKA and even higher. But with HHS, your blood glucose levels will be much higher, much, much higher, um, 600 and higher. Medical emergency with HHS still require, you know, DKA still requires very fast treatment, very quick treatment in order to correct the, the acidosis and correct the overall problem. Um, but HHS has a much higher mortality rate than DKA. HHS still is going to require um, excessive fluid replacement so that we can um, correct their fluid imbalances, correct the electrolyte imbalances, and restore kidney function, restore blood pressure levels so that tissues and kidneys are getting the perfusion that they need. These patients need IV insulin. Um, they will actually need more fluid replacement than what we give our patients with DKA, so just keep that in mind as far as lung assessments, um, kidney function, urine output, all of that. And then we absolutely need to monitor the serum potassium and other electrolytes and replace those as needed. With DKA, you can see either the hyperkalemic or hypokalemic state, depending on uh, the severity of the disease, or the severity of the syndrome with hyperosmolar hyperglycemic syndrome, all of the electrolytes are going to be depleted because we've got that overall um, fluid deficit and excessive urination. So we're going to need to replace all of those, uh, monitor and replace electrolytes as needed, and then figure out what their underlying cause was. With DKA, we can reverse the uh, acidotic state within, you know, hopefully 12 to 24 hours, and your patient would be on a diabetic diet and subcutaneous insulin. With HHS, it can take um, upwards of three to five days for the neurologic symptoms associated to clear. And the, we continue the treatment for HHS well after um, the metabolic abnormalities have resolved. So recovery with HHS is longer, and um, many patients are going to need uh, more close, closely monitored blood glucose levels afterwards to prevent this syndrome from developing again. Nursing management for DKA and HHS are very similar. Um, the overall approach, similar. Fluid replacement, correction of the electrolyte imbalances, depending on which ones are present, insulin administration for both of them. Your, your HHS patients, again, remember I said like DKA is your type 1 diabetics. Type 1 diabetes is an earlier onset, so either adolescent, you know, young 20s, young 30s will be your type 1 diabetic patients. Your type 2 diabetes patients are your older adults, so, you know, age 50 ish onset. Um, because your type 2 diabetic patients are older, that means your patients who develop HHS are also going to be older. This even more so drives the importance of the close monitoring of volume replacement. Excessive uh, lung assessments, serial lung assessments, breath sounds, making sure that we're not throwing them into a fluid volume overload. They're higher risk for heart failure, higher risk for cardiac dysrhythmia. So they need the fluid replacement. They need the excessive fluid replacement. But because they're older, they might not be able to handle the aggressive fluid replacement as well as a younger person would. So paying closer attention to those. Um, we initiate fluid replacement with just regular 9% or 0.9% saline. Um, if the patient has maybe an elevated sodium level, you might use a half normal saline. Um, once with DKA, you get the patient back into normal blood sugar ranges. So maybe around, like when we start to get to that uh, 200 mark, your physician might order that the patient get started on like a 
D5 half normal saline, uh, so where the patient gets some sugar in their IV fluids while they're still on the insulin therapy to prevent them from dropping into that hypoglycemic range. We're going to assess their renal status. These patients will either, if they're awake and conscious and can use a urinal or a bedpan, uh, even maybe they're able to walk to the restroom, we're going to monitor their urine output. A lot of these patients will have Foley catheters in depending on their level of consciousness, so we'll do you know, hourly intakes and output for the patients. Cardiopulmonary status, they'll be on a cardiac monitor checking for cardiac dysrhythmias and uh, pulse ox, making sure the respiratory status is okay, and then monitoring level of consciousness. We would be concerned if a patient was alert and talking on uh, these insulin drips, and then all of a sudden they became unconscious, and we, might, we would be worried that maybe they went into a hypoglycemic state and lost consciousness as a result of you know, getting too much insulin and they don't have enough sugar in their blood. So frequently monitoring that, making sure your patient uh, stays conscious and alert and their, all their cardiac status stays appropriate. Serial assessments are key. Your overall treatment goal is just maintaining fluid and electrolyte balance, making sure once you have corrected it and maybe the patient is ready to go home, that they understand you know, what happened, how to recognize the symptoms should they happen again, and then as well with, as well with all diabetes, preventing associated complications. That is a wrap on DKA and HHS.